Thank you. Hello, um, welcome to Torres District Council's meeting of external overview and scrutiny committee, Wednesday, 1st of June. Um, this is quite strange for me. I've been vice chair for quite a few years, but I've never actually had to chair a meeting. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, so. Also, agenda item one, apologies for absence. So I've had apologies from Councillor Wiseman. Okay, Chair. Um, we've had apologies from Kenton Baker, Councillor Manley, Councillor Woodhouse, and Stacey Jordan, Head of Legal. Okay, thank you. And um, go through the minutes of the last meeting. Page by page. Okay, so the page numbers at the top. Page one, page two, page three. Page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight. No? Councillor Lever? I'll move those minutes, Jane. Oh, thank you, Councillor. I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Harding. <clears throat> yeah, okay, oh, yeah, well, there's in favour. <laughs> Any against? Any abstentions? No, thank you. Have we got any public participation? Not today, Chair. Mm -hmm. And so the action list number 118, um, we've got a report coming that's ongoing. It's coming to the next meeting. Yes, yeah, correct. That right? Um, regarding citizens' advice grants, which has already been approved by the budget, but we still need to have the report come to external. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and 119 update of the board plan was complete. So that can come on. Yeah. yeah. Next. And the next one, Councillor Manley met with um, Chair of Mid Devon Scrutiny Committee just before the last meeting. I think that will go on the forward plan. Um, right? Yeah, as far as I understand it, Chair, um, Councillor Manley might have another meeting with Mid Devon just to clarify where who's involved from the storage perspective. I think that's where it's okay. at at the moment. Okay, yep. So that's sort of ongoing. Um, 137. I think we all received the emails through from Karen in answer of the questions or the questions that we had to the Environment Agency. So that's complete, thank you. Um, and the next one, the answers from Southwest Water, it says complete, but actually we didn't receive all of the answers because I've, I've spoken to Councillor Harding and um, about the concerns of the raw sewage at Bucks Mills. Yeah. Basically, I've got a little update. Mark Beer from Moratorich has um, got hold of us and uh, said that uh, despite his earlier um, pessimism, uh, he can confirm that Southwest Water had just announced the, to have accepted in principle the first time sewerage scheme of um, uh, Bucks Mills. Um, there's a few details uh, um, that they um, time wise say they, 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 they have no information, but however, the project needs to be placed within five years due to the, the statute anyway. Um, basically, they, they've got to give us a lot more information, um, and, uh, but it is going to be going, they're going to um, adopt the uh, old sewerage, um, which has never been used um, down through, which uh, Torridge um, got. I think in 1978, 79, something like that. So, uh, you know, so it, oh, things move slowly in our neck of the woods, but it, it looks like it is moving. So that's good. But they're still yet to, okay. to, to tell us exactly what they're going to do. So I was wondering if as a committee, we could contact them again with confirmation of what's actually happening to try and push that forward. It would be good. Some clarity would be good. Do we need to vote on that? We'll just make it an action point. Put it down as yeah. another yeah. on the action. Yeah. 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 Y
Declarations of interest, members with interest should refer to the agenda item and describe the nature of their interest when the item is considered. Agreement of agenda items part one and two, there's no part two items. Are there any urgent matters brought to bring forward? In the permission of the chair, I haven't received any. No. So now, Natural Devon, an opportunity to hear from Harry Barton regarding the progress and pleasant nature of Healthy Network. Thank you and welcome. It's nice to have someone here in person rather than through a screen. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. So, um, so yes, I'm going to talk about progress in the nature recovery network map and toolkit. And yes, I'm Chief Executive of Devon Wildlife Trust. And uh, the nature recovery network uh, is really a concept that's not owned by the Wildlife Trust at all. And I'd like to think it's owned by the whole county. Its moral ownership, if you like, is the local nature partnership. <coughs> and um, the accountable body is the Devon County Council. And we're the grants who try and make it happen. So we have the next slide, please. Um, we've got, as I think we all know, uh, amazing wildlife here in Devon. We're very, very lucky, particularly from, uh, compared to parts of the world where, where I was brought up. I've only lived in Devon for, for 12 years or so. And these include uh, the large open areas and, and bogs on areas like Dartmoor and the Heaths on Exmoor, and of course these wonderful um, flooded river valleys that we have in Devon and Cornwall. Um, this one's just around the corner from where I live now. Uh, something unique, really, to, to Southwest England. And next slide, please. Um, and just as, as good as the stuff we have on land is the stuff we've got out um, at sea. And in fact, at least half our wildlife here in the southwest region is out at sea. So we've got these wonderful reefs, uh, these kelp beds, these um, seagrass beds, etc. Most of us don't get to see that most of the time because it's hidden beneath the waves. But we do quite often, um, if we're standing on the coast at the right place at the right time, see something really spectacular like this, like the dolphins. And of course, the dolphins would not be there if it wasn't for all this invisible stuff. Next slide, please. Um, but we know we've lost an awful lot of nature and a lot of travel. We know that we've got an ecological crisis. And there are a few reasons for this. This is the first reason. Um, we've lost an awful lot of that natural habitat. So there's a habitat called Crumb Grassland, which I'm sure you're well aware of. It was, I wouldn't say it's unique, but it's highly unusual outside uh, northwest Devon and northeast Cornwall, a few bits of it elsewhere. And you can see here in this slide um, on the, on the left-hand picture, this sort of very sort of scatter uh, approach of tiny little dots around. It now covers about one and a half percent of the landscape. You look at uh, to 1947, you're looking at 30 to 40 percent of the landscape covered. So that's a huge reduction. Uh, next slide, please. And a lot of the remaining bits are very isolated. Now, having said cool grass, this actually is cool grass, and uh, so this, this is uh, a different type of habitat, but it's, it's, it's in this area. Uh, this was, you're looking at one of our smallest nature reserves, it's about five acres in size. It used to cover this type of habitat, the whole of what's on that slide there and beyond, but you can see agriculture, build development, etc., cetera, is eaten into it. Now we do our best to look after the nature reserve, it's a lovely place, but every decade we record less and less wildlife on it. And the reason is that because it's so small, every population is very small. So one hard winter, one bad drought, the population is wiped out and there's nowhere from the surrounds for it to come back in. So there's a problem uh, with, with trying to conserve wildlife in lots and lots of those tiny little sites that you saw on the previous slide. Next one, please. We also have an issue with the condition of habitat. Now, I spend a lot of my time on Dartmoor. I love running on Dartmoor, and my heart runs sinks when I come across a landscape like this because you can't try and run through it. Um, but it is amazing for wildlife, and it's even more important for carbon and water supplies because, of course, this is just like a giant sponge, and all the, the, the sponge is made up of this you know, tens of thousands of, of years of accumulation of peat. And when it's in good condition, you get these wonderful things the butterwort, um, the sundew, etc. on it. But next slide, please. Uh, most of that habitat is now starting to look like this. So dry summers, uh, erosion around the edge of these, so it drains it off and it dries out and that peat starts to oxidize. And so sadly, most of the bogs on Dartmoor now are sources of carbon rather than sinks of carbon. And you'll probably notice the grass and around it is looking rather like dull as well. And that's because as it's dried out, it doesn't support all that wide range of species it once did. And next slide, please. And what really upsets me is that we're still losing stuff. We're doing a much better job than we used to in conserving this, but we're still losing stuff. Now, this isn't a very good quality couple of slides. You can imagine it's not easy getting pictures like this, but this is, this is two days apart, um, and this is a, a marine habitat. And on the left, you see something that's 
all right, it's not from a David Attenborough film in, in the coral reef in the tropics, but it's a quite a healthy bit of, of seafloor habitat. And on the right, this is what's happened when it's been bottom dredged. And that, it takes away, of course, the habitat, but it does something else as well. It stirs up all, that, all those sediments in the seafloor and all that carbon, this is an incredibly important source of carbon that doesn't get talked about much, that all um, will bubble up into the water column and eventually find its way into the atmosphere. So it's a big problem for the climate as well as, uh, as the seafloor habitat and the fish that, that feed on it. Next slide, please. So um, things need to change, we all know that, and we've had some very important policy drivers in the last few years. So here's uh, the first one, the 25 year plan to improve the environment, which came out a few years ago, followed quite uh, closely uh, by the Environment Act. And now, of course, we've got a green paper on environment targets. And this is driving uh, several things. And one of the things that was in there was this mention of the Nature Recovery Network. And the Nature Recovery Network really is just is this idea of more habitats, bigger areas, better connected up, and in better condition. And it's very much a concept. Next slide, please. Um, but like all these concepts, it needs to have some high level ambition. And what the scientists tell us we need is 30% of land in sea, land and sea rather, in recovery for wildlife. Now I say in recovery because you can't just wave your magic wand and create a nature woodland. It takes quite a long time, decades or even centuries sometimes. So this is about getting everything in the right direction. But that 30% is a key figure for us. And in Devon, rather alarmingly, it means pretty much doubling the amount of land that we have in wildlife compared to what we've got now much more than that in some other parts of the country. Next slide, please. Now, um, first bit of controversy is how do you interpret that 30%? Because this is absolutely critical. We've got to know what we're trying to aim for. Now, DEFRA's original, I say original because it's slightly changing its tune now, its original interpretation of this was that the third, anything that is protected by way of you know, a landscape designation would count towards the 30%. So all of Dartmoor would count, all of Exmoor would count, all of North Devon area would be would count. And you see the trouble with that interpretation straight away. So this is Exmoor. Um, I love this part of Exmoor. It's just around the corner from where my, my parents got married. Um, and uh, so you're looking across this beautiful landscape, but of course you can see most of that is pretty low tiers, is actually quite intensively farmed. It's not actually land for nature. Some of it is, but not all of it. So the real picture um, is, 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 means that we've got a much higher target to reach than that. Next slide, please. So this is where the game plan, plan comes in, the nature recovery network map uh, that uh, we've been dri driving forward at the Wildlife Trust. And the first stage <coughs> is to work out what we've already got. And you'll think, would you not, that after all these years, we'd know exactly what we've got in Devon. And I'm afraid you'll be wrong, um, because we have lots and lots of data, but they're all different data sets, they're all different ages, they're all stored in different ways, they're all incomplete, they're not all compatible. So it took us a good year of work just to, get, to come up with a consistent picture of what we've actually got. And there are lots and lots of ways to show that. No one map can show you all the, um, the wildlife habitats you've got because it'll just be a horrible mess. But this is the sort of thing you can get uh, as a result of it. So, but that's, that in itself is a big step forward. And you can see this picture of you know, very, very scattered little bits here and there. Next slide, please. Now, more excitingly um, is looking at what the landscape of Devon could actually be in the future. And again, this is complicated because uh, the, uh, there's no one answer to that. You can take a field out there and what could it be? Well, it depends what you do. If you graze it lightly, it might turn into some sort of scrubby open area, open, you know, open um, mixed habitat. If you completely leave it alone, it will eventually turn into one sort of woodland uh, or other. Uh, so we've actually looked at this in two different ways. We said, uh, bearing in mind that most of Devon will turn into some form of woodland, except perhaps the very highest bits of, of Dartmoor and, and, and uh, flooded valleys. Um, we, we, the, first, the first way we looked at it is to say is what sort of woodland would this turn into? And then the second, which is what's shown here, is, is what other type of habitat, if we managed it a bit, would it turn into? So you can look for every bit of, uh, of Devon's land, you can come up with at least two answers to what that habitat could be. So there we are, cover the whole of Devon. Um, and this is very broad brush. Of course, we can go into a much, much finer um, scale if we want to. Next slide, please. But of course, we're not trying to turn the whole of Devon into one giant nature reserve. You've got to have land to grow food, you've got to have land to build houses, etc. So we've got to um, we, you know, we've got to refine this down a little bit and say, where are, are we going to try and do this? And there are a number of ways we can do that. This is one. This is some work we did a few years ago, actually, identifying what we called strategic nature areas. So these are areas where 
the land perhaps wasn't of the greatest value for farmland, um, and there was lots of bits of habitat already quite close together. So you wouldn't need to do so much work to link them all up together. So that's one possible filter you can put over it. Next slide. Sure. What's the difference between the blue and the grey? Now you're asking me. <laughs> um, they are, they are um, they're there to indicate uh, clusters of habitat with a particular type of habitat dominating. Okay. So um, the the um, the green one, which covers Dartmoor, isn't just all upland heath, but upland heath would be the dominant habitat. Okay. And so the, the the green, sorry, the the um, the blue in the top left uh, is cool grassy dominated, and the brown would be woody dominated. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> So you can bring it down a level. So this is looking at uh, uh, Torbay. I'm sorry, I have one for Torridge here, but this is some work we recently did on Torbay. And what this is doing is saying, okay, again, at a fairly broad brush level, but a little bit uh, a finer scale, um, what sort of habitats can we create? So um, the yellow, this is valleys that could, where, which would be good opportunities for restoring wood. Steep-sided valleys, not great um, for, for modern farming, um, and already quite a bit of woodland there. So great opportunities in those yellow areas. Uh, the the, um, the purple areas, that steep-sided uh, um, uh, coastal habitat, great opportunity for restoring it there. And the brown areas, they are other uh, probably mixed habitat areas where you might want to create a lot of open open um, uh, habitat as well for local people in Brixham and, and, uh, and Paynton to enjoy. So that'd be a mixed habitat area. So it's still quite broad brush. Next slide, please. Um, you can take it down at a fine level too. Now this is Exeter. We call this the extra, extra biodiversity reference map. So here, every single bit of open space in Exeter has been mapped. And we might want to turn to woodland uh, or open grassland or scrub or wetland or, or something else. Easier to do that in an urban area, to be honest, because most of it's built on. So yeah, and, and most of the rest of it is unlikely to be farmed. So it's a, it's, it's a little bit easier to do it there. In the next slide, please. Um, we can do this also um, and have been doing this in the, in the more rural areas. Uh, this I should stretch is a, is a fictitious farm, uh, but it shows the sort of thing you can do. So you can take this right down to field by field basis and say, uh, this we would leave alone, but this is not a particularly productive area of land. Um, it would be a great opportunity to return this to cool grassland or woodland or wetland or something else. So it's a very, very useful decision making support tool at a strategic level, this, but also at a very much an individual and the ambitious level. Next slide, please. Now, um, I've been talking very much about nature so far, but there's more than one agenda at play here. You probably heard this latest buzzword, nature-based solutions, which basically means anything that nature can do to help the societal or economic problem, be it health, um, water, or anything else. But what I wanted to, to, to focus on particularly here um, was the role of nature in flood alleviation and carbon sequestration. And some work that's been done by a number of scientists suggests that uh, over a third, this is 37%, which I think is quite optimistic, but let's say about a third, which is a quarter of a third of all our emissions could be dealt with, um, in other words, uh, sucked out of, sequestered, sucked out of the atmosphere by nature, if we look after it properly. So if you look at the next slide, please. Um, on the left, you see some work that we are doing at the moment. <coughs> please don't take this literally at all. This is a highly pixelated, low resolution um, image here. But when we have finished this work, we should be able to say every single bit of Devon, what is the potential for that land for sequestering carbon? And on the right, we should be able to do exactly the same in terms of natural flood management. Both of these things, important policy drivers, huge amounts of money thrown at this. So if we, we, so if we can throw all these layers of data together, we can, just, we can say you know, a number of things. First of all, where's the best opportunity for restoring wildlife? Secondly, where we get the best bangs for bucks in terms of carbon sequestration, flood alleviation, and any number of other agendas. And obviously we have to do that because A, there isn't enough land to go around, and B, there isn't enough money to do everything we want to everywhere. So these are things that hopefully, elements that we hope will be finished within the next year. Next slide, please. Um, we are also, this might take a little longer, we're doing the same in the marine. Now, the marine environment is a lot more problematic. As we know, it's, we know much less about it. It's a very mobile, um, a lot of things out there, they change quite regularly. We don't have um, boundaries of land in the same way that we do, um, uh, uh, sort of boundaries in the same way that we do on land. 
Um, but we think it's equally important because it's so critical for in terms of a carbon store and so critical in terms of fish stocks and, and, and our wildlife. So this is the kind of thing we'll be working on, uh, on in the next two years. And again, there's lots of data sources. This one, the one on the left here, shows broad habitat types. The one on the right shows fishing pressure. So there's lots of different, you know, there's pollution data, all sorts of things we could layer on top to see where we could we get, again, the best bangs to bucks for doing this at sea. Next slide, please. Now, there's an obvious question with this, going back to land, which is, can we really do all this and feed ourselves? Because we've got a big problem, not just in Britain, but in the whole of the Western world. And if you actually look at the demands we place on our land uh, for food, for timber, for living space, for, you know, for nature, for, for housing development, we probably need two and a half UKs to do all the things we want. In fact, some people argue that the population of London alone requires the land area the size of the UK to feed it and meet all its needs, which is pretty alarming. And this is one of the reasons why we keep seeing habitat and stuff being destroyed in places like the Amazon. So we've got a big problem, as not just in the UK, but as, as, as the world order to sort this out. So if we look at the next slide, please. Um, I think there are a number of things we could do. One is that we have to be much more scientific about how we do things. So we say, for instance, we can, you know, we can plant trees on a bit of land, or we can let this go back to nature a bit, and it'll sequester carbon. That's not good enough. It depends what the starting point is and depends what the end point is. So this is some work some colleagues um, uh, of mine did. And you'll see that if you're looking at drained arable land, so arable, what land, which, sorry, peatland, which was, was peatland, but it was drained and used for arable land, haven't really got much of that in Devon, but they've got heaps of that up in, say, Cambridgeshire and Lincolnshire. If you rewet that, you get enormous benefits in terms of carbon sequestration. Um, but if you slightly change the way you, um, you manage your farmland, you will get some benefits, but they're much, much more modest and planting trees somewhere in the middle. So uh, it's not just about restoring nature, it's about exactly how you're restoring nature and exactly where you're restoring nature. So this should help us pinpoint things much more and be much more efficient about how we do things. And the next slide, please, uh, rather more controversially, is how we use our land. Um, now, this is, uh, I don't have the answer to this, I don't think anyone really has the answer to this, but if you've looked at the National Food Strategy of Henry Dimbleby, uh, this is the first report, the only report I know of that's really wrestled with the subject of how do we use our land more effectively. And what Dimbleby argues, agree with them or disagree with them, but he argues that actually we do have enough land if we use things differently. He argues we're putting a third of our land in high yield farmland, you know, big fields of wheat, etc. Um, a third of our land roughly, very simplistic of course, in low yield farming, that's the sort of um, extensive livestock farming you might have on the edge of Exmoor or Dartmoor, and a third in semi-natural land, effectively for nature. And he says there are three things you need to do if we're going to do that. One, easiest, we've got to cut down on food waste, because a third of our waste goes in the bin, food rather goes in the wind. Second, and secondly, is we've got to drive some volume production indoors. Bit controversial, but actually, if you look around there, it's already happening. Uh, more and more stuff is now grown in glass houses and things. And thirdly, and most controversially here in Devon, uh, he argues that we need to reduce our meat consumption quite significantly. And whenever I say this, I, I, I see the, the looks of disapproval. But actually, I think what Dimbledy is talking about here is not so much the kind of extensive livestock we tend to see a lot of in Devon, but these very, very intensive livestock units you see in some parts of the UK, but, but in other parts of the world as well. And producing, I have to say, quite low quality meat. So it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, but we are going to have to wrestle with this because whenever I talk to, say, um, farmers groups or others about restoring land for nature, they say, well, how about that for food production? So we, we are going to have to, to find a way around this. Next slide, please. So anyway, Nature Recovery Network, it's all in development. It's at the moment, it's, it's on the, uh, the County Council, Devon County Council Environment Viewer website. The front page looks like this. So all these elements are being updated constantly and hopefully month by month, the data will get better and, uh, and more clever, et cetera. And if someone comes and talks to you in 12 months time, it will be far more zingy than what I'm saying now. Um, and final side, uh, I sometimes get asked, uh, you know, what would it look like if a nature recovery network was actually put in place on the ground? And this isn't my work at all. This was Expo National Park Authority's work. Um, a, a, a figment of the imagination, of course, a uh, bit of artist work, but it's, you know, it, it's interesting to see what the landscape might look like. And I think the artists here um, took the view that it was an upland landscape, it's a national park, they didn't want to lose all the features of the current landscape. You see obviously there's room for farming and other land uses there, but you would see a sort of softening of the, uh, of, of the edges and uh, taking the foot off the pedal, if you like, in terms of human 
uh, influence on the land. So there we are. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, have we got any questions? Yeah. Uh, well, basically, I, I'm uh, um, involved with farming. My, my son's got a farm. I used to farm, and um, we we uh, farmed a, a bit of land which was full of foot cone grass, and we had wet ground. My father, when he was in the seventh in the nineteen seventies, he drained acres of it and uh, i think one of the peat uh, bogs went down about six foot uh you Scary. know so i mean there's so much water in that in there i mean it's lush now grassland but you know i've always said that you know we, we need to work with nature rather than work against it and uh, and basically farms have to uh, you know feed and uh, and uh, and make it make a living as it as you haven't got that natural um Patchwork. So, how can you kind of compensate the farmers with subsidies and incentives? So how do you do that? And also, um, you know, I've noticed that there's always these little blocks where somebody does a nice good thing, and then it's all of a sudden there's nothing. And you need to make these wildlife corridors because it's like the badger. If the badger is, uh, gets too many, he, he has a big fight with all his neighbours and then they, they, they go and, and, and the young get pushed out or the old and then, you know, then they reset somewhere else. And, and this is why the five acre is not enough because, you know, it, it, it kind of, there is always a, a, a yin and yang going on. And uh, so you, you need those peripheral ends. So wildlife corridors seem to be the best idea. So surely, there needs to be a more of a joined up thinking with, yeah, with farmers. Yeah, I mean, lo loads of points that uh, you made there are all really good ones. I mean, first of all, yeah, I mean, for, for decades, farmers were paid to drain these things and yeah. fire them up and take up the hedges and stuff. Um, and sometimes it made agricultural sense, sometimes it didn't. I think there's an opportunity now with elms, although elms has been a little bit disappointing so far, let's face it, but I think there's an opportunity with elms um, to, uh, to drive things a different way and compensate farmers properly. Now, personally, and I've, I've written to our, uh, all our local MPs about this and uh, lobbying nationally. I think the sustainable farm incentive, which is largely seen, I think, as a replacement for the basic payment scheme, is in no way fit for purpose. I don't think it's clear what it's trying to do. I don't think the payment levels are high enough. Uh, there's no sense of ambition there. Um, the things like um, you, you monitor your soil, but why? You know, you've got to have a, a reason for doing these things. So I think it needs a real rethink. And it is disappointing that it's it sort of lost its original um, sense of ambition. But I think it's not too late to save it. But I do, I do think the new subsidy regime really has to build some of this stuff in. I also think, you know, that there's things that make sense at strategic level and things that make sense at an individual farm level. So at an individual farm level, we, we have um, 25 odd farm advice at the Wildlife Trust. And, you know, most farmers are exactly like you. You know, their main business is producing food. That's why they're farmers. But there are always corners of the farm where they like to do other stuff as well. Um, and what we can do with a model like this is say, well, where actually you can get the best bangs for bucks? Because you know, maybe there's a stuff, some of you obviously use a farm, you'd know this anyway, but there might be steep slopes which yeah. are being ploughed. And why? You might actually be putting more energy to that than, than getting food out of it. So why don't why we let, let that go into a habitat that will actually help um, slow the flow of water, uh, sequester some carbon in the soil, etc and get some wildlife benefits too. So we can always do that at an individual farm level and, it, and it, it's easier to do if you get some decent incentives through, through the subsidy scheme. But then I think at a more strategic level, we need to be able to answer your five acre question, which is, you know, these things on their own, it's nice to have them, but how much do they actually deliver? So there where I think we can say, well, there, there needs to be areas where the scheme can say, okay, we're going to try and prioritize, maybe get a bit more money, maybe to make it a little bit easier in these particular zones to do this kind of thing. Um, and, and then hopefully you'll get, even if you do get individual five acre patches, they'll be much more closely connected to each other. We can perhaps build hedge networks and other corridors which don't take too much um, you know, productive farmland away to, to knit them all back together again. So there's, well, I think we've got the potential to do all this. It's just the schemes to fund it aren't quite, quite ready yet. Well, I, I listened yesterday with interest to uh, Professor Peter Smith, who's a soil scientist, and uh, he was saying that sometimes it's not the right idea to plant trees because you've got grassland and that's holding in carbon. It's, a, it's more of a, um, a parkland and it is a, a, a permanent pasture. But the silliest thing in the world is to, play that, to, to dig that up and plant trees because by the time they get 
to the uh, state they need to, that grass would that, that grassland would have held in the carbon. So how how much of science do you use, you know, for that? Because you know, obviously, you know, you you're advising farmers to do that. Yeah. So you've got to look at all the. We tr we try to be uh, as science led as possible. So we generally, uh, my my general feeling is, if you want to plant trees. Uh, it's a good idea to do it on the most me, knackered land possible. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. If it's already a decent habitat, don't plant trees on it because you know, even if you're creating something good, you'll be losing something good. So yeah. what's the point of doing that? Um, there's, you know, there's enough land. We, we can um, quadruple easily the amount of trees we've got in Devon and not touch some of the best habitat we've got. So there's, there's absolutely no reason for doing that. Um, there, and there are some well uh, publicized examples, like the best one is what happened in the 80s when there was a tax break for planting conifers in the flow country, which yeah. was bad for all sorts of reasons. Um, but it's still, it, I think it's happening less now than much less than it was, but it, it is still an issue. But, but science is absolutely key to all of this. I think mm -hmm. the more we have to be really data driven um, because yeah, it's all about fine tuning now. We don't, there isn't enough room for um, flexibility anymore. We've left it too late. We've got too much to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's it. Yes, Thank you, Chair. Um, Harry, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation about the loss of the calm grass habitats. And now, is that through climate change or development? Or well, it's, both? it's, I'm pleased to say quite a lot of them have started to be put back, which is, which is great. But the original loss is actually quite recent. So compared to, say, ancient woodland and, may, and hay meadows, water meadows, which are lost principally in the 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s and 60s, the cool grassland was mainly lost in the 80s and 90s. And um, a mixture of things. Some of it uh, has been drained and improved. My fact. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, plants pay to do yeah. that. Uh, some of it has been, a lot of it actually was planted with conifers um, under, again, incentivized schemes, not obviously very well, um, very well directed, but that, that happened to a lot of it. Some of it uh, was neglected, which isn't necessarily bad in the end because you can get some quite nice woodland, but you do obviously you gain one habitat but lose another, so you don't get any overall gain there. So those are the, the three main reasons for it. Um, and uh, interestingly, going back to, to the point just making before, where we've been quite successful in, in reintroducing it is actually land that is all, almost always of marginal value to the farmer anyway, because you need to work so hard to keep it dry. Um, to keep, you know, to stop the nutrients all running away. So when you actually think about all the, all the chemicals, all the energy you're pumping into the land, it's actually better sometimes just to leave it and let it reverse to what it would naturally be. And then you still get benefits from it. They're not food benefits so much, but they're benefits in terms of storing carbon, purifying water, reducing flood risk. Thank you. Councillor Langford. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. That was fascinating, and I think I understood most of it, which is <laughs> that's brilliant. That slide is so useful to have a picture of what it might look like, and you can really see what would be wildlife corridors and everything. What I specifically wanted to ask was, you know you were talking about the moor and the fact that the parts of it now are, are give, producing carbon, and I'm saying, can that be salvaged, or is that because of climate change? And it it, I can be salvaged. I mean, it's it's not easy because mm. obviously we tend to well, every year is different, isn't it? But um, we tend to have on average longer and drier summers now. Mm. Um, and uh, some of the things that have happened in Dartmoor are centuries old. So uh, Dartmoor, as I'm sure you're aware, was a heavily industrialised area in Victorian times. There were old rail lines all over the place. And all, one of the areas I like to run on is called Red Lake. And actually, you look around, you see this huge, great sort of it's like a sort of um, and a tar sands type development, it would have probably been at the time. And, 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 and so what you're actually seeing is a healed industrial scar over a lot of Dartmoor, and it might take several hundred years for all that to come back. But there are some things that can be done. And I think when, I think particularly in those, in those um, raised bogs, which is when you get a sort of lens um, mm -hmm. on the top of the hills, um, they're particularly prone to erosion because you can imagine as, as the, it's a, it's, if it's in a valley, then the, the water sits in the valley, but if it's on the top of a hill, it's easy for the edges to start eroding and then all the water pours down the hillside. And the way to restore that, it's quite intensive, I have to say, quite expensive, but they basically just plug the areas where you get the most of that erosion going on, the gully erosion, that just keeps the water in place. Um, so that can be done. Um, the, uh, I think the, you, there are areas where um, land has been just badly managed so i think probably burned too much in the past not so much as present but a lot of this was happening in the past so 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 areas that have been burned over and over and over 
Um, and I think there is the case for saying, okay, if we can, it's obviously always difficult in there, we've got common rights, um, the common grazing rights, but if we can say, we'll just leave these alone perhaps for a decade, let, let the landscape heal a little bit, and then it can start taking a bit more human intervention again. And then another thing we're doing is, is trying to protect the, the valley myers, which is they're, now they're on the edge of Darmore, um, and um, a particularly well-known one. I might have heard of Ems where they, you get pictures of these all the whole thing covered in bluebells. That's one of our, our nature reserves, and that's one of the valley myers. But they're not protected at all. So a lot of them are, are still being altered a lot of the time, and they're really not very large areas. And I don't think there's much to gain agriculturally from. Uh, for trying to improve them so we're just suggesting protect them because they are so good that, you know, that they actually heal much more quickly because they're not so high altitude things are the <clears> more <throat> growing conditions are a bit better they'll recover a lot more quickly if given half a chance and actually they're a lot more wildlife rich as well and the ones on the top of the very top of the hills thank you thank you councillor laws thank you very much um yes i'd be interested to know uh, how closely you work with districts and county and government on planning um, because we get a requirement here to build X number of houses and um, in our local ward we're going to have upwards of a thousand new houses in a strip backing on the AMOB and, uh, and that work and those houses will have a real um, just within the last week, animals are being cut off and living within that narrow strip. And we're actually getting deer now coming down to Western Open. Gosh. Now, it just concerns me that, that you're working as hard as you can, but when you get to the top layer, and I hate to say this, money counts and you've got these huge companies. I, in our, not our ward, in Torridge, I do not see thousands of people wanting to buy houses in Westbrook Home. What I see is people who want to come here and buy retirement homes or second homes. What influence do you have and have in talking, particularly Torridge? Torridge, and even our own little local town, it takes years to evolve. Are you talking now to try to get some structure in? Yeah, no, really, really good point. And um, yeah, it's always a concern, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're trying to gain one side and then you find yourself losing ground on the other side. So we engage a lot with the whole development <coughs> industry at a national level. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, domination of a few big companies is problematic, not just in the housing industry, it's in, it's in probably lots and lots of sectors, but particularly in that sector. Um, and so we do engage with that. Um, but I think they are a mixed bag. There are some, I won't be wrong with me to name names, but there are, there are some companies that I think are genuinely wanting to change, wanting to push the agenda with eco homes and build more green spaces around developments, which of course can be done. And there are some good, not uh, or rather depressingly few of them, but there are some good examples of where you know, nature and all these things can be built into new developments. You can actually end up with something that is better than than what we started with, but very often that's not the case, and very often the houses are not well built. And in fact, a lot of the houses built now in terms of ecological standards are probably worse than they were 15 years ago, which is very, very frustrating. So we are engaging, I would say, with mixed success at that national level. At the local level, I mean, well, uh, we try and work with every council in terms of uh, feeding into this local development framework. Uh, last year, actually, we I think we we commented or objected to more development proposals than we've ever done in our history. So it's that's partly because there's so many many more of them going on at the moment. So it keeps us extremely busy. In all honesty, how effective are we? I don't know, um, but we will keep trying. Yeah. Can, can, can I just come back? One of the problems we have is that, and I'm sure it must frustrate the council member, our chair of planning, is that. When a planning application comes in, it seems to have to be looked at in isolation. Mm. But on this particular side, I was talking about there could be five different aspects. Yeah, the issue of cumulative impact, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, uh, and and you could have, if allowed, built in corridors and all sorts of things without taking huge amounts of housing away. Yeah. Uh, it just seems. 
frustrating. It's very frustrating. Well, actually, just last week, I wrote to all um, 12 MPs in Devon. Um, they hear from me rather more often than I think they'd like. But um, in this case, I was writing them about the, um, the levelling up um, and whatever it's called that, but, you know, which is essentially about the new planning system, among other things. Isn't it? And um, this point of cumulative impact was something I made quite strong in that letter. Uh, because, and you're absolutely right, you know, you could, each thing is, you know, it's a straw that frankly comes back, isn't it? Each individual straw is not particularly significant, but taking them all together, it can be very, very significant. And I think it's a real weakness in the proposals that they don't take enough account of that. So, yes, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, if I could. I think uh, so it's a good point to make, Councillor Laws, but, and, and you're quite right that a planning application is considered on its own merits but a cumulative impact should be considered a plan making stage. So as you formulate your local plan, things should be allocated and the cumulative impact should be looked at at that point. Now, the problem we've got currently is obviously we're not plan led because of our current lack of five year housing land supply. So you have unplanned for development coming through the system. So that's why we work with um, local partners like the ARB partnership, like the Biosphere Reserve, and, then, and you have in place you things like your, your biodiversity net gain that we work with them to try and get the best out of, but it is essentially unplanned development in those instances. Okay. I, I must just come back and say, okay, so are we working with our MP because he's putting the government doing too much strain on us and we can't we can't work within the limits. No, you said that we yeah, I just find it so frustrating that you, your hands are tied now because we've not we've not built enough, and that just seems ridiculous that we carry on. The, 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 the you, system, the, the system. No, I mean, I think a lot of us would entirely share your frustration. It is very, frustrating. and of course, um, you know, the, to sparing your blushes, but I think like most local authorities, you know, you have an awful lot of resources taken away. Um, you're going back 10, 15 years from having ecological expertise in the house, which yeah. has had to be sacrificed. Yeah. Um, and um, it's not, you know, the whole system is not as efficient as it once was, and things don't get picked up, understandably, because of that. So another point I've made to um, um, to MPs is that needs to be addressed. Yeah. You, need, you need to be resourced to do your job properly. That's a good point. Well, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk and a really important discussion with planning um, because we do things in the micro, we don't see the wider situation and we've got to get a grasp. And um, we've got a development out here that um, it's been a clash between agriculture and housing and all the rest. And uh, it's going to be an interesting debate that's going to come out, I think, at the end of the day on that one. Um, but I want, to, I want to first of all declare a personal interest because I'm a landowner. I do receive um, payments from Her Majesty. I'm glad she's still there to keep paying me. This is a good, good thing to go on. I'm glad she's doing it to keep the price of food down, but suddenly the price of food is beginning to rise very, very, very dramatically. And I'm at an age that I've now seen things go full circle. I was born and I was given a, a Russian book. You wouldn't believe it seeing my size, but um, <laughs> um, I, I was, and, and um, I trained in farming, uh, trained in agriculture, and we were trained under a white paper called Food from Our Own Resources. I think it was a 1966 white paper from central government, and um, it encouraged food production, and it was done then by the politicians who had served in the Second World War, and we had to produce food from our own resources. We were dependent upon food because obviously German action, U-boats, et cetera, et cetera, and we were struggling to survive. And um, we were being starved out rather than blown out, if you like, out of, of, of the North Sea. And that's the way it was going. So the policies came, and I can see why we had all the drainage done and all these lovely areas because we wanted to grow grass and wheat and corn, et cetera. Interest in that slide, you said 29% from improved um, good quality peatland, because that is where the real driver for carbon capture is, if you follow logic to it. But then, um, and I think, um, um, Curtis the Harding mentioned about the 80s, and you mentioned about the 80s and change. And the change there was that because we were under intensive production all the time and we were paid pretty well most for anything, um, we kept producing. And there was aircraft hangers full of grain and uh, butter mountains and wine lakes and tomato tins everywhere. Um, there were farmer let lorries going around Europe with nothing in them and claiming subsidies and all the rest of it. It was unbelievable. Um, and that was right in the middle of the 80s, and they changed the scheme from being paying for goods 
for actually paying more towards managed the allowance. So the production wasn't there. We went back into a just in time food production situation and it had a huge effect, not on the primary um, uh, industries, but the second industry. Now, if you look at Torrington, um, do you, I don't know if you know Torrington at all. A know? bit, not that well. I heard of it. Do you know the big creamery down at the bottom of Torrington? I, well, there was a big creamery quite close to Torrington, which all closed down. Yeah. 1984. 1984, yes. Yes, right. And, more um, than a few years ago. The policies at the time decided that there would be no more about payments. They were going to stop the subsidies for food production. <laughs> and they put a cap on it and they did that almost overnight and that was a new production at Torrington that was never used. There was also a meat plant at Torrington, there was also a uh, corn merchant at Torrington, there was also a uh, milk marketing board uh, situation at Torrington. I used to work at Saikan, it was a big paper factory that was shut down, yeah. yeah uh, and really all happened in the 80s with the change in policy, agriculture policy that came in, into being. I can see why, because it was totally stupid to have Rain mountains coming over ears, and, and I can see why that it came in, in that direction. But the sad thing for, for our secondary industries was that Torrington became a, a, a business town, and it's a business town that died. And the new businesses, what replaces we have in Torrington now, is the elderly. And we have care homes in Torrington, and it's the biggest business in Torrington. So it's a town that died. To be re resurrected by caring for the dying, which is a quite a strange <laughs> say, way of saying things, but it killed an agricultural town that was dependent upon secondary agricultural businesses. And I hear all this, uh, and you know, I do receive payments, and I'm grappling with the changes, and I'm very disillusioned with the ELMS systems at the present moment mm -hmm. because I'm trying to understand it. I read that I can't even start considering things until I register with some authority who have not even given me any carbon codes about the land that I own if I, I decide to go down this line. I also go against the background that I see a government who's prepared to do deals with Australia mm -hmm. and import beef on a less quality standard that we produce in this country. And I wonder where we're going to go because what I, I think we're going to finish in the worst for porridge economically and our local plan or our, our Torrance profile is not very good at picking up agricultural activity, but it's the secondary industries that again are going to suffer here because I think the prime industries are going to go slow down, but I don't think it's going to be replaced anything by secondary industry because once you plant a tree, you don't need anybody to do very much until you harvest that tree 30 years later. And I've just got a word more. If you go to Melbury Woods, which is one of our woodlands that a lot of people walk, it's the most uninhabited of wildlife areas you can ever wish to imagine. It's trees, yes, but there's nothing in it. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, I don't it. know. A lot, a lot of, a lot of these um, uh, poor, poorly planned plantations aren't that great. I agree. No, I mean a lot of really good points there. No, I mean I'm I'm um, I'm in my mid fifties, so I remember a lot of this myself. Um, and I was raised on a farm, and I have I've never called myself a farmer, but I have managed a couple of farm businesses before, although not some never. And you know it's it's really really difficult. I agree, it's really difficult. Um, I think the current system is a mess. I would entirely agree. It's deeply frustrating. We don't pay payments um, for we don't pay basic payment scheme, but we have claimed things like stewardship, and then had to pay it back for a load of it back for some completely spurious reason. Uh, you know, it's, it, it drives you absolutely insane. But it's, so it's a real opportunity to sort sort uh, um, sort it out. And I think elves. So far, I hope it changes, but so far, I think it's a missed opportunity because it just doesn't have there's a high level rhetoric, and then there's what's actually happening. There's a big gap. So that. Um, in terms of uh, you know the the stuff, the the post war mentality of got to produce food, really good reason for that. I mean, absolutely don't want to slip back into where we were before and not being um, properly self sufficient in food. Um, the nature of gender and carbon gender incredibly important too. I think I don't see those two as so mutually exclusive as some people do. It's difficult, but you can find ways of bringing them together. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're going to bring them together, you've got to sort out the mess, which is the subsidy reading. But can I just then continue to follow on from Chair with your permission? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I mean full circle is that um, part of our income comes from payments from the government still. We're sure. still in the old systems, okay? And now they've suddenly this year, only a month ago, brought forward our payments early because they want us to put fertilizer on the ground again to grow more wheat. And I'm suddenly seeing decisions made as I saw as a child and when I was training in agriculture to increase our food production again, which is almost contrary 
So when I started seeing it go full circle, I've come from post Second World War to wanting less agriculture to all of a sudden in the last two or three months since the Ukrainian situation, wanting more wheat. And when you see some of the decisions made by India to ban all wheat exports, for instance, some decisions made by Germany, we seem to be behind the curve a bit, but all of a sudden, the last four or five weeks, we receive stuff going through the post. The government wants us to produce more food again. And I, I just find, how do you find that when you're dealing with it? And that's what I mean when we're going full circle, because we're going back into post-Second World War. It's, it's, it, at the moment. it's deeply frustrating. I think there's, obviously, there's a, there's a crisis which we hope will be short-term. Uh, maybe not that short term, but it's you know hopefully won't won't last for too long. Um, I think it's always dangerous to make long term policy on the basis of a short term situation. Personally, um, but I think there are things, a lot of things that the government could do to alleviate the food crisis we've got, which they're currently not doing. And I'd love to see them do. Um, I think the single bet, the single. Easiest thing they could do, which won't necessarily solve everyone's problems overnight, but I think it's just to make the schemes they got much, much clearer. Um, because I think as farmers, you need to know the direction you're going in, and and you need um, once once you've agreed with the people giving the subsidy what the direction is, they need to make it easier for you to do your stuff. Um, otherwise, money gets wasted. We don't achieve anything, um, and and the and it becomes a mess. So I think if there's one thing they could do, we sort that out. Clarity, uh, yeah. I was just wondering if we could put that into a recommendation from this committee um, to go forward to central government. Because obviously we've heard from you, and we've heard the concerns, and they are concerns that we've shared, a lot of us from the farming community, whether we could put that forward. Um, does that need to be a proposal? Well, that's for you. No, I think I think clarity, um, great greater clarity in the um, in the subsidy regime is is absolutely critical. Yeah, yeah, and and, and in, internal coherence, perhaps we could say as well. Um, would you like to put that forward as a proposal, or shall I? Do you want me to <laughs> word it? Yeah, do you want to word it? Well, I've simply worded that my proposal would be that we ask um, the DEFRA Department, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, to be give greater clarity um, in the direction that we'd like to give rural areas in the management of land so that we're encompassing all areas in that, not just agricultural businesses, but we're actually asking for clarity of how we manage the land resource that we have. Yeah, and I would second that. Is everyone happy with Do that? you need to get the, get the subsidy word in there, though? Um, I think it's it's subsidy and policy drivers as well, isn't it? So it's sort of both both of those together. So yeah. subsidy is the money, but then the policy mm -hmm. is the kind of direction yeah. setting and the regulations that go around it. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we write to Geoffrey Cox and the Secretary of State for DEFRA? Yes. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Good idea. so recognizing <laughs> that. Perhaps we should write to Neil Parrish because he did the champion, he's not the champion. <laughs> <laughs> he knows a lot about combines, I think. No, tractors. So the main issue is our concern over the environmental land management scheme. We recognise that there's an opportunity, but it's not being it's not being acted on and we need more clarity. I don't think we have to put in the subsidy bit. Let's be simplistic. That's a, a concern. It's money, it's not a need to reform it. Yeah, because I've spoken to different farmers and they, well, they've basically said they're not going to bother with the elms because it doesn't make any sense to their commercial business. Um, so it is a great opportunity and it needs to be acted on right now, otherwise it's going to be missed like you think. Anyway. Okay, so that would be really good then. Yeah, <coughs> Councillor Leather. Yeah, I've been interested. Oh, we need to vote on it, don't we? <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Thanks for the presentation. I'll be interested in listening to all of you. What surprises me this afternoon is this nature partnership, the LNP, was actually established 10 years ago. And it's the first time I've ever been at Torridge. And I see from the letter that went round that um, Torridge District Council suggested they would like to pledge towards this work earlier this in the year. So I 
know you're, you're looking for funds. I've seen the councils that are involved, and I just wonder what kind of funding you're looking for from the district council. Oh, right. Okay. So, so I think the the oh, local well, just yeah. them. Oh, right. Okay. Well, the local so the local nature partnership was yes. That first came in the in the white paper in 2010. I think yes, that was under a previous political regime. Was it 2012? Anyway, it's you're right. It's about 10 years ago. Um, and it was set out, yes, it has been running now for 10 years, and I'm currently its vice chair. Um, we obviously haven't done a very good publicity job, we haven't heard of, which I apologise. Um, I think the organisation looking for funding isn't actually Devon Wildlife Trust, I think that's the county council who pay for the cost of administering it and would like to share that a little bit more. We actually, Devon Wildlife Trust gives a small amount of money, about £3,000 a year, to help with those costs, and most of the organisations part of who are part of the, the LMP do that. And, and the Local Nature Partnership is, I mean, it's not one of these organisations that, that's going to revolutionise the world, but it's a very good opportunity for people from all sectors, you know, the local authority, staff agencies, NGOs like ourselves, health sectors and, 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 and community groups, just, just to find common ground. And we've got quite a few things done through it. So I think it is, and you know, this is, this is one, one of the initiatives, so I think it is worth supporting being part of. Um, if we can tell you more about the LNP and find ways to get you more involved, then I'd be very pleased to hear from you as to as to how you think we can improve. Yeah, we we already contribute to council and others. So from the planning budget, we make contributions to county council, um, to through county ecology, um, to the parish. Thank mm-hmm. you, on, thank you on the council's behalf. <laughs> <laughs> I'll feel better now. <laughs> the LNP specific. No, to the county council. So it's natural devil. Yes, natural devil is, is the name of the, the local the local nature park, it's a sort of generic name and it's called natural devil. So I was under the impression that you're seeking extra funding. Is that not? Um, not, me, not me personally, <laughs> no, but um but uh, I will uh, it might be that there's conversations going between Sarah Jennings and um, Pete Chamberlain yeah. and your your Yeah, officer. so so we we fund uh, at Sarah's request, we we started funding a couple of years ago actually, and we fund each year making an annual contribution. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's a couple of thousand pounds or something like that. So, I do, that. do we need to do anything as a committee regarding the funding? Is it? No, there's no formal request for more okay. funding. No, I'm, just, I'm not here to ask you for money, that's not <laughs> <what I'm saying. laughs> Just kidding. Oh, I, I didn't realize that. I thought that that's part of the meeting. <laughs> but that's good, thank oh, you. Well, you'd like to come on another occasion. <laughs> it's not a chat show. <laughs> so where do you see it going now? How well, do you see it going? So I think our next um the, the next plans for this, the nature recovery network, is to work through this carbon and those the the, the, the water um flood alleviation connectivity to pick up your another point you made is another really important element to this we had done some work on it but everyone argued around it so we've, we've taken away and haven't <coughs> it, but our connectivity is going to be really important and then the marine so we'll keep building and building on the database um, and then i think we just need to try and make all the schemes out there that are already in existence work as well as you we can for this so there's the biodiversity net game which obviously looks to planning controversial but it's there we need to try and make it work if we can there's the whole um, carbon agenda of the Devon Carbon Plan, again, another way of trying to make this work. There's the whole uh, food agenda and, and ELMS, exactly what we've, we've talked about. But I think there is obviously space for nature in here as well. Um, and then there are other emerging agendas as well. So I think the, the Nature Recovery Network map itself doesn't have any statutory teeth. I love it if it did, but it doesn't at the moment. But it's a decision support tool at a strategic level and at the local level. Um, and I guess uh, when it comes back down to the local level, probably the most powerful thing we as an organisation, Devon Wilder Trust, can do is just keep out, keep going out there, talking to farmers and finding ways where they can do the things that suit them and suit nature on the land. Because uh, that's where you really make things happen, is, is working on the land, as, as you would know, as farmer. I think there's one other thing to add, actually, if it's OK. The, 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 um, you obviously do an awful lot of work with protected landscape lives, don't you? So with the, with the uh, North Devon Coast, the ALMB, so and the biosphere. So they fact they do quite a lot on the delivery of the plant, don't yeah. they? And we actually fund local initiatives that contribute towards the on the ground delivery. Yeah. So different projects. So not necessarily funding the strategic elements of it as much as you might want to, but we actually fund the local delivery of some schemes that contribute towards delivery of the plant. Um, should we go back to voting on the recommendations? 
Um, Karen, what have you got? <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit. Um... Okay, so um, I wasn't quite clear whether you wanted subsidies. <clears throat> But basically what I've got written down is like um, that you want to uh, request or ask a death verifier a death care to um, the um, MP and Secretary of State of uh, death care. Um, you wish for clarity in uh, regarding <coughs> the subsidy regime and more of the internal coherence is what Harry said and then greater, greater clarity in the management plan. Okay, it was quite wordy. <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? I reduced. Obviously, I'm going to count. I think the word policy might want to go in there as well because it's kind of policy and subsidy together, and the two linked together, and one one reinforcing the other. I'd be happy to look at or yeah, and we'll together a letter, and then we can add a little bit more in there from what we were discussing about our concern over the elms, etc. If, if the rest of the committee is happy with that and we vote on that principle. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, did we have a proposal? Yeah, you proposed by. Yeah, yeah, it was well, a proposed by. Well, I have a proposal to put the word subsidy in. I want to keep it non political because subsidy is a huge political argument because from a food producer's side, it is cheap food that the subsidy is protecting, not agricultural businesses. And you go into the land of politics if you put the word subsidy in because there is two sides to how you view a subsidy. And I would want to keep, and I'm going to put my proposal, and if somebody doesn't want to second, that's fine. But I'll put it down here to bring forward clear directions in regard to future land usage with particular focus on the ELMS schemes, full stop, end of. And that is my recommendation. So it, it, you can make it what you like. You can be argued from the agricultural side or the wildlife side. I think there's so much we've got in common. So I'm, I don't want us to be on other sides of the pond. We are in the same pond together, if you follow logic to it. But I want us to be able to, to have a common voice because we are rural territory. And interesting, Steve's farming, I'm farming. You know, um, and, and it's, it's an unbalanced balanced view in this committee. And you're, I think, you've got some connection with farming as well. There. Yeah, I think you told us previously, actually, yeah. if I listened carefully to you. So um, I, I didn't want to, to get into the, the agricultural versus the, the wildlife situation. I just want government to be more clear about those who work in and manage within the countryside as a whole, the direction they want to take. And that's what I want to try and achieve from the resolution I've been forward. I think I'll repeat good. it again if you like. Yeah, repeat it again, please. Okay, <laughs> to bring forward clear directions in regard to future land usage with particular focus on the ELMS schemes, which is the Environmental Land Management Schemes, full stop, end of. Yeah, I'm happy to say. And that. we can all, I imagine, you get around that, but I don't know, but if you want to make it, but that's what my proposal is, and I will call for yeah. a second. Right. Can I just? Quick, can I ask something? Because right? yeah. I don't have the, the same level of knowledge and understanding of all as you do. But would that therefore include? Because I thought from what you were saying before, that one of the issues was that the subsidy schemes aren't clear. We're not questioning the subsidies happening, but just that there isn't enough clarity within it. Is what you've said there, would that encompass the clarity of sub the subsidies available? Should you? Or yeah. not? I think it does. I think it would. Yeah, yeah. That's fine, because I yeah. don't have the, yeah, that's fine. I think it would, Thank and it's up to anybody reading that to make it what they want. So I leave it to the, you know, I have beauties in the eye of the beholder, and a motion is in the position of the listener. Would you so, be happy to be involved in the writing <coughs> wording of the letter? Because I'd like to put in there about it being a missed opportunity. Yes, yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay, you can add that in the letter as well. Is it, Okay. We'll keep it simple, and I, I go back to the, the proposal I would make, and I would call for a second. Okay, I'll second that. Can we vote? Everyone in favour? Anyone against? Any abstentions? Yeah. Thank you. And I was thinking as well, in terms of Council Lord brought up about planning and the local plan review, whether the committee should put forward a um, recommendation about the importance of building nature into developments and highlight that 
as part of our local plan review. I don't know. Okay. Can you do that without legislation alone? Can we, can we do anything in that regard? Um, I mean, I suppose what you could do is uh, impress on the joint committee the importance of the Devon uh, nature of recovery plan in mm. policy making. Yeah. I mean, and and you know, it's a, it's over to that committee to consider that then, and obviously it's going to be considered as part of the plan making process. But you know, if you wanted to make that recommendation, that's just to problem, impress right? the importance of the, yeah. the, of, the nature yeah. recovery plan as part of the yeah. which committee. The Joint Planning Policy Committee will be the committee that makes decisions on your new local plan. It's certainly not going to hurt to, to mm. insert that, given something you think about. Yeah, I, I would propose that. Is there a second? Oh, second Councillor Langford, everyone in favour? Um, against? Any abstentions? Um, would anyone else like to raise any points? Can I just ask one? One more thing, yeah. if that's okay. What what would you want from us, from councils? I mean, is those are those types of proposals are they beneficial to what you believe in and and hope for the future and everything, or would you be asking councils to do other things? Yeah, gosh, yeah. <laughs> so it's a great question. No I, mean, I think I think no, no, it's a really good question. I think wherever. You have influence, and obviously the one that I'm most aware of is through the planning plan process. I think that's where you have the ability to build some of the stuff in. So the point just raised uh, by the, the council, the other councillor, was about building nature into developments. I think is really critical. There are obviously there are mechanisms there already, like biodiversity net gain, not used as well as they could be. Um, but I think to I think if we can have um, you know developments of a high quality and high ecological standard as well as having the you know things like sustainable urban drainage schemes and, and green space there as well high quality managed green space it makes a huge difference um, and uh, that that I think is probably the single greatest thing that a local authority can do but then also there's you know there's feeding constructively into all the the county based. Um, systems, I call them influence, like the carbon plan and, and other things and protected landscapes, because uh, where the best results are found are always where people are working together constructively towards a common aim. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And just one last thing I've got written down about your 25 farm advisors with the wildlife trust. Wildlife trust, how do people access them and is, what's the charge? Or so, so, okay, no, well, it's all for free actually. Um, so, uh, they because we're mainly grant funded, so we've got some through up through the upstream thinking project, which you might well have heard of. So, that's funded through Southwest Water and ourselves, the West Country Rivers Trust, and over in Cornwall, um, our sister organization, the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. We all have farm advisors. Now they work in particular with the catchments. So here we have them working on the Tamar. We used to have them working on the Tor and Torridge, but unfortunately, Southwest Water don't fund us through that anymore because there isn't a sewage a water treatment works because they need to justify that in terms of purifying the water downstream. But we do have them working on the Tamar um, and almost all other uh, uh, Devon catchments. Um, the other scheme is something called, and this is much more focused in Torridge, it's called Northern Devon Natural Solutions, and that is um, funded largely through the Environment Agency, and uh, that's really about trying to find the best places to, um, to manage land in order to benefit the water resource. So there might be slowing the flow, reducing flood peaks, um, reducing soil erosion, increasing water quality, and we do a lot of work around the Torridge on that. So the way to access them um, is to give them a call. But actually, our guys are, um, I use that in the unisex sense of the word. So our people um, are contacting farmers proactively all the time, saying, can we come on your land, do a survey, give you a bit of advice. Sometimes they say no, but most of the time they say yes. And you know the mechanism we usually use is good old stewardship and whatever's going to replace it, local nature recovery scheme, whatever we hear the details of that. So um, yes, okay, that's how it works. I better check it as 25 now. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it seems to change every month. It's more than 20 that much, I know. It's less than 30 minutes now. <laughs> it's on YouTube. Now. Yeah. That's the Pennington. Um, go back to good quality wildlife. Um, I live in a very rural area. Um, and I went to stay with my son in Stafford the other day. And I saw more wildlife in Stafford than I did in my lovely rural position. I saw six foxes, three badgers, <laughs> seven rats. 
um, <laughs> that were following um, the rubbish being put out um, um, around the various estates of Stafford Town. And apparently these animals now have learned where the rounds are because they moved from one part of Stafford one night to the next part of Stafford the next night. <laughs> they're they're running the rubbish the waste is exactly. Stafford I know we've done a wonderful league and our work waste and recycling here, so I'm not commenting about porridge. Um, would you encourage, definitely encourage wildlife in various ways to come back by various means? Because it's very evident that wildlife responds to positive strokes. And what steps would you recommend? I noticed you've got a badger up there on your, and there's a history between TB and badgers and all the rest of it, as you're aware of, I'm aware of. Um, um, what would you comment be about in actually in positively encouraging wolves back into uh, yeah, the area? Well, well, we, I mean, uh, you're talking to the right, right, or not, not necessarily about wolves, but you're talking to the right organisation in terms of reintroducing species, because of course you've led in England on, on, on the beavers, and um, actually my nice place is that the garden that one in Chelsea Flower Show was full of bits and pieces which were largely collected from rivers and Devon, and including our, our beaver enclosures. So, so there we are. Um, so we're, no, we're very interested in bringing, bringing stuff back. Um, we're looking at other species as well. We're not actually looking at the wolf. Um, the reason we're not looking at the wolf is, first of all, I don't think the public is quite ready for it yet. Um, second is, I don't think um, Devon would be the obvious place to do it because you actually need a population of about 150 animals right. to, to sustain them. thought about it, Harry. Yeah, so <laughs> have we have thought about it. And, and, and even dying is not big enough for that. So I think, you know, I wouldn't say no to wolves um, indefinitely, but I don't think, I don't, probably not in my lifetime. Not your lifetime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because up on um, Rappingford, um, there was um, the release of some wild boar. There was, a, there was an actual guy there that produced wild boar, and they, they were released into the wild. So it's quite interesting the effect that's had on a small area yeah. of an export. So people you know, do re-establish themselves yeah, after do. a while. Well, he's, before I came down to Devon, I lived on the edge of the Forest of Dean. Yeah. There's hundreds of them there. Um, and you know they're controversial um, ecologically. They probably have a good impact, although yes. some people think they make uh, make quite Very a lot of But they're uh, <laughs> yes, yes. They're, they're, they're you know all, all these animals are controversial. I mean, they're one of the, they're probably they've been wiped out most of them because they were controversial at some some point. Yes, I right. mean, pine martins and other species, wildcat, the last. Would you believe it? The last, but we think of wildcats as being Scottish, mm -hmm. uh, but, but they're you know they're not well suited to be honest for living in the Highlands of Scotland. It's just where they haven't been shot at. But the last place in England they were found was on the edge of Exmoor, just in the border between Devon and Cornwall, about 100 years ago. Well, we do have a wild deer problem here, and yeah, from an agricultural point of view, yeah. but not from an aesthetic point of view. So like, they exactly. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think the nature is, is resilient in many ways, and that, um, that there's something, even if it might just be back here, that can live pretty much anywhere. Yeah. So you, you change the environment, something else will benefit. You know, rooks and and and, and rats are very numerous now, but haven't always been. And obviously sparrows were very numerous when we all had horse drawn carts and people used to spill the grain that was used for feeding the horses everywhere and, uh, and the sparrows built up and under there. Um, and you know there's hope as long as we don't lose them as complete, there's always hope that they will come back. So I think it's all about how you manage the land. Yeah. And and speak, you know, I think even except that something like beavers, you know, uh, the populations will grow at some point they will need managing. If there isn't something that'll leave there, that leave them, then, then at some point they will leave managing. But that's the, the reality of the landscape we're in. But we, we've got on the, the Bridge. Exactly. Exactly. There are lots of lots of easy wins. There's lots of low-hanging fruit for nature out there. We should we should grab it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. See, not making any recommendations. That's the reintroduction of books. But I'm very happy to second it. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Really Thanks. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Um, the annual report, number nine in the agenda. It's all been sent round, it's in the agenda pack. Mm -hmm. I don't think I need to read any of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, sorry. Thank you. Can you send us your contact details, Harry? Okay. Yes, of course. We know oh, actually, yes, you yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, thank, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank uh, Councillor Manley has written the introduction and it's got the report. Um, right, I'll put you on the right page. Of external. Do you want no. me to read any of it? Shall no. I read her? Look, okay to me. 
Can I just I, I, I mentioned it to you, Chair, before we got yeah. into the meeting. I think Councillor Newton's name should be listed because he was a major part of the committee for yeah, completely agree. Uh, I think under the Sins Advice Bureau uh, piece, it's twelve pounds. I think it's fifty thousand pounds. It should be. Um, which page is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's got 12 zero, zero. It should be 12,000, shouldn't it? It's just one zero. If you look in your, your, what, your you've, what you've done, Councillor, is you fund them £38,000 a year as a standing grant. This oh, right. year you've made a one off £12,000. Yes. There's a zero missing. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. All right. <laughs> We've got that one right from that blue. Because it is 12,000. Yeah. 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 And can I list something just to raise a query? We went to the fourth now on the CAB in a minute, but that's yeah. my two comments on the on the vote paper with those two amendments. If you're happy with them, Chair. Yeah, very happy and completely agree. Councillor Newton um, was on the committee for a long time, and that's really good that we should recognise that. Um, do we need to vote on that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Councillor Pennington. And I'll second it. Um, all in favour? Yeah, unanimous. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or any against? Any abstentions? <laughs> um, that's that one. Last bit consideration of the board plan. So we've already got, um, perhaps the man who's already organised for 20th of July, link centres and mental health service provision. And that's been confirmed. Yeah, she's requested. Um, she's been in, um, she's been in contact with him to offer the date to him. So okay, so fourteenth of September. There's a few suggestions underneath. Mr. Um, Chair, are you, are you, are you, are you, I haven't been here to the last few meetings. Are you just doing single item agenda? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fine. I was going to say because it wouldn't be all the work to just get that grant. Oh, well, yeah, the grant will go to July because it needs to yeah. because the next payment is due yeah. to go out in September. In terms so of presentations, you've just been put yeah. one focus, I think that's worked yeah. quite well because previously when we've had more than one, it's yeah, yeah. Um, so should we look at filling a few more? A few more? I don't know if dentistry, yeah. that was what you brought up, yeah. yeah. I, I'd really like some. Something because um, we had the NHS and everything, but I, I would really like something about um, dentistry if it's possible. Yeah, maybe a presentation, but some sort of um, because we've got input. here invite the clinical commission on these. Yeah, I can try, I'll find out who that is. And so it was only yesterday I've seen people on social media saying that they can't get their children in. Oh, it's a dentist, yeah. It's a real problem. I don't know how we can tackle it as a council. That's the thing, but we can raise the mm. concern over it. Is that for the September? Should we put that into 14th of September? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, what about 26th of October? I'd be quite keen to hear from Burton Art Gallery because they've been doing a lot of things and we haven't heard from them. That's halfway through the year, so it's a just a halfway review of their year's work. Yeah, have we got the community safety partnership that comes in October meeting? Well, yeah, later on in the year, if that's okay, Chair, because that, that's a statutory function of the um, yeah. group. Should we put that for 26 October then? The CSP? Yeah, yeah. And maybe 7th of December, Burton Art Gallery? Um, so that's, that's, that's a joint meeting with North Devon usually. The, joint meeting with the, the community safety. Yeah, we've got a notice for you this morning. Is everyone happy with those suggestions? And then when Councillor Manley's back, we can. Did you do want to raise them about CAB? Oh, yeah. Councillor Pennington, you had um, concern about the citizens. Yeah, just to raise um, there was a report um, put out to all members from Stacey Dory last week. Um, I, I'm the lead link member with Citizens Advice. Uh, it was a good report and they do a lot of good work um, um, in regards to the situation. And there's a good report there um, about non means tested benefits. It's um, working with the Seymour unit, which I totally applaud. The people facing illness and the people facing illness have had a hard job, particularly for the working age. Um, but what I'm getting back um, is a situation of people failing to be able to contact the CAB. And um, 
Um, I, I did email Stacy and I tried to speak to Vicky and Vicky's away till six. But I just wondered if anybody's had any other reactions or any difficulties in contacting. And I would just want a little bit more focus towards means tested benefits. I was shocked, I have to say, I was shocked that, that this universal help with our electric bills and not focused on those that need it most um, in last week's government announcements. And I really would like to focus, if I could, on um, your know, um, means tested benefits. And that means pension credit for those who were uh, a pension age and uh, universal credit usually for those of the working age. Um, uh, and I would like a report, if I could, and I would like a report to include something about availability um, of the service to particularly those who are um, electronically disadvantaged, because I think there is a real problem there with people who don't know how to use electronic communications. Yeah, I was going to say, because when they came and spoke to us, they said the best way to contact them is through Facebook, but obviously if you haven't got that access or... Chair, I mean, if we're bringing a report back to the next meeting to talk about the funding, and the funding was specifically designed to improve their uh, interaction with the, the public most at need at this time of crisis. I don't see any reason why we couldn't ask those questions of Vicky for inclusion within the report that comes to the next. Chair, I'm yeah. very happy to And then just, that just put happy. it into the next report for the next committee. I mean, it might just be a paragraph response from Vicky, but it would be something. Excellent. We can speak as well because. I think the recommendation coming out the last time they came was for Chris Fuller to make contact offering trying to work up part time or something. And I know he made contact. Mm, yes, with us, I'm not sure where that went, but we didn't follow that. But up. one of the gaps that appeared to me because I have two or three people from Postley contact me saying, Where is the contact Postley? And in the last um, newsletter, it only mentioned offices at Torrington and Biddeford, and it's not universal across Torridge. And I don't want to be too specific. But there was a, 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 appears a gap across the, the wider rural area in particular. So, so Karen, sorry, Chair, did you did you capture what the Councillor Pennington wanted us to ask Vicky Ackley? The question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. I'll tell you what else do I have to observe. Can I just double check something? I'm assuming anything about the play strategy would be in, would be in internal, wouldn't it? It's just that the play strategy was mentioned in the review. Joe had mentioned it in the review. So if we wanted to <coughs> sort of look at that halfway through the year or something, that would be an internal. I think it is external. Well, well the thing is, it's very difficult actually because I'm not sure that there's a QBR measure in internal that would track the deliberate play strategy. I'm not, I don't, I can't recall a QBR. And we had Adrian Adrian come to Exile, didn't we? I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any problem with Adrian coming back and giving you a, at some point a, an update Cause, on what's going on. Because he's not actually on there, is it? And I think yeah. that would be, um, I mean, I, I, I'd set, leave it if you want until Joe's back, but certainly I would, if it's not going to be on internal, I would like it on external. We've I, got, I was wondering if, because we've got down here Richard Pace, Parks, Ground Maintenance, whether that could be Richard Pace and Adrian Avery, because they're kind of working together, aren't could they? Be. Yeah. Because yeah. they go hand in hand now that we've got it back in house. Okay. I don't know when <laughs> we would put that in the cycle. Well, I know it's six been... months, of skill, excuse me, six months would be a good time. So after, yeah. after six months of, uh, of, of us bringing the service back in house, yeah. I think uh, Richard, I mean, um, he's getting the handle on it already, I know, but uh, the, he learns something new every day. So it would probably be good to wait six months and then he can tell you how it's performing. Should we put that in then provisionally for 1st of February? Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Hudson. I'm, I'm just a bit, uh, I know I'm not a member of this committee, but I'm not sure about me. I can't understand why you think the play strategy um, and Richard Hayes and the services he's providing are external matters, they're internal services. I know, but they've always come to this committee for some reason. I, I don't well, know why. I don't the think. grounds maintenance was an external contract. It was, yeah, but it's not. But, but it is no longer. But so the player strategy, strategy, that was already always considered yeah. by. I, 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 I think the point you're making is exactly right, Councillor Hosson, to be honest. I mean, it, but I, I, like I say, I'm, I don't think naturally there's going to be any inquiry from. Uh, internal into the play strategy delivery because there's no formal reporting mechanism within the QBR for them to interrogate on that. 
So I guess you're the committee here that proposed that strategy and you're just interested to see how it's progressing. In terms of grant maintenance, on reflection, I completely agree with you on that point. I think that's how we interact. Can I come back again, Chair? Yeah. I'm glad uh, Sean has understood my, my message, but with referring to the place strategies, and saying there isn't anything in the QBR process. The issue for me is that we review our strategic plans, and that is um, something that is contained within the QBR. So therefore the play strategy forms part of that. And it's not, I'm trying to take something away from this committee, but I think it's important it's heard in the context it should be. Yeah, I think I mean, you're right. I don't, I, we've all left in each other like, yeah, we, we do agree that so, so I really we, think so it's something that ought to be taken up with the chair of internal. Yes, yeah, so that's a recommendation from here to, to Council of Austria. Yes, that yeah. we need to we need to have that under review. It had been dealt with here when it was in its infancy, but now we recognise it's an important part to be reviewed under internal. Yeah, I. Um, actually <coughs> definitely came up in the last QBR because I asked a question on it. I can't remember. Under which yeah. bit it was, yeah. but it didn't, it was there. Yeah. Well, Councillor Pennington? Yeah, I've just taken a total point of view here because uh, we did so much work on the play strategy prior to the um, um, last uh, uh, full council, uh, no, three years ago then, uh, looking at the play strategy, putting various recommendations in place. And I think it was me that made a call in to bring one of the issues about funding to, mm. to full council. So there is a real role for, for, for external here to look at the social value of, of, of some of our institutions. I think internal has gone down the line of, of, of looking at the cost of everything, the value of nothing. And, and we have to have a balance here. Um, and I think that what external do so well is look at the wider social values. And today's been a classic example because we look at the wider issues of, of, of the use of our countryside and our play parks, their open spaces, and there's a social value. And I think it's external for our, for our partners here and um, the people who come. And I think it's really fundamental that this committee keep a hold that they can ask any officer providing services that come to our meeting if it's so which of the council. And I think the play and park strategy is fundamental to being part of, of the board plan if we want it. Shall we keep that as? So remove the grounds maintenance and just keep it as play areas come in February. What about recommendations to internal that we'd like it? Well, I propose we don't remove the ground maintenance. I'll make that proposal if anybody would second it. I'm on my own again. I'll yeah, now I'll second it. No, I'll second that. Really. <laughs> I see you again. Yeah, but it, Chair, it is an internal service. Grounds maintenance and the play and the play strategy. It was voted on as an internal operation. Now it's not an external body. And it's re we're supposed to be with external issues to the effect of the choice district. I think I'll defer this plan, Councillor Manning. <laughs> 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 Councillor Hawking. Well, it is, um, yeah, maybe internal, but the it's effects bad. the effects that it has on everybody else is an external effect. And, uh, I think we should be able to ask questions on, on that. Yeah. Carl, you can do it through internal open ministry. If they, yeah. if they have it brought to them as an action, which is an object they will be, look at it, grounds maintenance and, and that. We can, any of us can go to that meeting and speak to it. But it's not hiding anything. But we're supposed to look at external issues. I made my proposal, Chair. I stand by it. I think I might have had a second there. I'm sure. Yeah, so, 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 so I, 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 I mean, from a process point of view, I think I agree entirely that the grants maintenance is an entirely internal matter right. and that the questions around the social value could be put to internal committee because actually it doesn't matter which committee asks the questions um, as long as you get the answers. In terms of the play, I, I think there is a dimension of it that is related to external in mm, the community engagement bit that was done. So perhaps if you specifically focused on that and asked Adrian to, to produce your report, not necessarily about how much we've spent on improving our own play areas, but how much work we've done with our communities to improve their yeah, play areas, the which is another of the strategic objectives. Working with yeah. the schools, so you could ask him for something specific group, on that. Which is external. There's a fundamental question here as scrutiny works on this council. We see not 
to be listened to in our external and we call things in and now we're getting sidelined if we vote against this proposal I'm putting forward. We as a committee have a choice if we want to bring forward things forward and we must scrutinize the decision making because it does affect external people outside our internal our Paris partners and all the rest. And I would go back to my proposal that we should be able to invite the ground maintenance people here and I stand by that proposal. Um, yeah, do you have a second? A second I don't, well, it can be decided at a, at a later date anyway, because it wasn't for the next meeting, was it? It was for February. You were, you were in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a second. Do you no second. <laughs> no, no second, but it's still staying as it is with the play areas, isn't it, anyway? As we, as we highlighted the text. And scrutiny dies on torch. I'm sorry, Chair, but that's my point. I disagree, but okay. have we got Avery, <coughs> Adrian Avery and the play area update? Um, yeah, with a focus on work for the community. Do we need to vote on the call of plan? Yeah, I think that's, that concludes the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.